I'm Leslie Bone. I've had an affiliation with the Stanford campus since 1983 when I worked on my first project at the church and after that I worked a little bit projects on the museum and then various um, projects uh, through the campus and uh, culminating in a, in, a, in a way for my biggest project which was after the Loma Prieta earthquake where I worked on Memorial Church and my talk today really is sort of about that period of time, although we, you know, we will go a little bit at either, either side. Um, and so welcome. Um, so one of the things that makes this talk di different to the other two is that we're here in the archives. So you know, I need to thank Josh Schneider very much for allowing us to be here and for getting special collection objects out, which you know, very few people get to see. So it's kind of a privilege that you're getting to see these objects. Um, and for me, it was kind of an interesting reflection on you know, the issues that I have had through my time working at Stanford, trying to find information about things that I was looking for. Uh, for instance, when uh, the mosaic angel fell in the chapel, I was trying to find an image of it because I wanted to see what that wing looked like before it fell. I could find nothing here. Um, I, I, looked, uh, I ended up looking in a lot of the archives that the photographers had taken, at the different Stanford News, and uh, everybody had taken, or weddings, everybody had taken pictures towards the altar. Nobody had taken pictures towards the door, which makes kind of a lot of sense. I, um, I went looking for old postcards. So there, there was an, uh, somebody in the Bay Area who dealt in postcards. So you'll see a selection here of postcards. And I actually found one that, that had the angel on it. Um, so that was kind of another way. But it made me realize that you know, I needed to be very um, vigilant, vigilant myself, that, that I needed to document and I needed to make sure that everything that I did was in the archives. So, so I gave the things for the 1990 project to the archives as soon as we were done. I actually made, I made three sets. I made one set for myself, I made one set for the archives, and I made one set for the church. And that's how I kind of operated through the whole project because of my frustration in finding that image for the angel. Um, and so in, in general, the records here are kind of spotty. Um, there's, you know, Bertha Berner, Mrs. Stanford's assistant, wrote a book, but she wrote a book 30 years after the fact. And I find it incredibly frustrating because when I want to know when did Mrs. Stanford go with Camerino to Paris, you know, she's totally silent on that. And like, like you were there, you were there, you spent two months with her in Venice. Did they, did they go for a weekend? Did, did they meet before between London? I mean, so it, it, those kind of books can be very frustrating. I think Gunther Nagli also wrote um, The Life and Letters of Mrs. Stanford, that's kind of another resource. Um, people who have looked before and done research, um, Gail Stockholm stands out, all her, I think Sapna, you have seen her notes. She did very thorough research, she didn't have the internet, but she was tenacious, I mean, absolutely tenacious. And it's through her notes so we learn that the, with the Salviati workshop during World War II was taken over by the Italian government and by the German Nazi government. And in taking over their building, they, reading between the lines, because Camerino is very diplomatic when he mentions this, is that they threw out all the archives and paperwork. So in a way, it's a miracle that those paintings that were later given to us, to the university, were survived. They must have been in somebody's private home at that time, or maybe when they were told to get out, they, they grabbed some of the paintings. Maybe Antonio Paoletti's family had the paintings, but, but the, the, it, it was actually a miracle that the, even those survived. And then when I um, went looking at Lamb Studios, even though the current owner of the studios, who, who has sort of nothing to do with Lamb, gave the whole Lamb collection to the Library of Congress, when you look through that, you think, like, uh, the, the, from here to 100 years ago, there's, there's good chronology, and then it's like, okay, so, so where, where, where is this stuff, right? And so about 30 years ago, I met with, um, I think it must be uh, Lamb's great niece, uh, and uh, Berea, and she said that actually a lot of this, the material, the, the sort of interaction with Stanford were in a warehouse that burnt down. So all that information, so that made me even more conscious now, like, like you know, that we really do have to um, 
to document our things because if, if these major craftsmen that we're using had these disasters happen in their workshops, then we have nothing, right? So, um, so, so it's great that we're here because it kind of reminded me of, of all that. And so, um, one of the, so Mrs. Stanford, she uses uh, two companies to complete this, this the glass project on the church. One uh, was Antonio Salviati, um, and I, and he he founded his company in 1859. And I sort of wanted to know a little bit more about this man because he was, you know, I knew he was a prominent lawyer in Venice. I knew probably that in, in about 1950, you know, he, he was very friendly with the abbot of Murano. And his also other great friend was the mayor of Venice. And I think those two men over maybe a glass of wine or maybe after church would get to kind of chatting about, you know, how sad it was that, you know, Venice was kind of on, on the on the, the, on the down, kind of the, I'm sure the, the mayor said, you know, I wish we had, you know, more industry, that we could, we could have, you know, more commerce in, in the town. Uh, I know that the abbot was very keen on his little um, flock in Murano. He wished that they could be better educated so that the, they could feed their families better, um, that they'd have more pride in their work. Uh, and he, he had two great ideas that he wanted. He wanted a museum of glass so that the, the, the glass buzz Milano could go and look at the beautiful past glass to kind of re-spark, you know, that energy. And he wanted a school so that little boys from a very early age could be taught how to draw, how to paint, how to learn the geometry of, and, and how to learn the basic techniques uh, in a kind of uh, workshop system of creating uh, mosaics and glass blowing. You see, in one of the photographs a little boy who looks about seven who's in the glass blowing workshop. So, so these three men loved their town and had this vision. And um, Antonio Salviati had gone to St. Mark's and he had, interesting enough, looked at the delaminating de 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 mosaics because uh, St. Mark's has oodles of different mosaics. Uh, done in different periods by different people, uh, and some are fantastic and doing well, and some are not fantastic and do well. So they need constant restoration. And so he must have talked to somebody on the site, and they said, oh, you know, we can't repair them because in Murano they no longer make the tesserae. So there's no way, and the only people that make this tesserae are the people in Rome. So the, the, the Pope was still funding some little workshop, but the tesserae they made in Rome actually were different to the Venetian tesserae. And then they, otherwise they would have to, I think the Russians were making Tessera at the time, they'd import from Russia. So, um, and Antonio, you know, he, he gets, I think, completely sucked into this thing. I mean, it's just amazing. He just, he just decides that, that he has to do something about this. And so, um, uh, he, I thought, well, did, did he just fund this? Like, did he fund that school? Did he fund his business? You know, he's a lawyer, he had lots of money. Or did he actually, learn about mosaics? Did he actually um, you know, understand what it took to make a mosaic? Did he understand the history of mosaics? Did he understand you know, the current art historical kind of thinking about mosaics? And so in my pursuit of that, and I, I was very excited, but I found that Ant Antonio had, Salviati had done a lecture in England in 1865, so he, he founds his company in, in 59, and in 65, he's already in England doing a lecture in Liverpool. So on, the lecture is on mosaics generally, and the superior advantages, adaptability, and general use in the past and present age in architecture and other decorations of enamel mosaics by Dr. A. Salviati of Venice, being a paper read. So this was super exciting because now I can suddenly hear the voice of, of the man, right? So it's not people, other people reporting what he said or what he believed. Um, here he is himself. And, and um, it's amazing. He knows, he, he has, in those five years, he has really studied the history of the day. He quotes Pliny. He quotes, quotes Ruskin. He quotes all the famous art historians in depth. He understands what they're on about. He knows the history of mosaics from Roman times onwards. He's visited every church in Europe that has mosaics. I mean, it, it, he's an extraordinary man. He's a really a Renaissance man. And I thought that the, instead of paraphrasing him, we could kind of, I could read you a little bit of what he had to say. 
So abandoning my lucrative profession, I directed my exertions and my capital to the development of the ancient famous Phoenician manufacture of the gold and colored enamels. By enlisting the aid of the eminent skill, practical aptitude, and long experience of a man in Murano, who had spent his life and fortune in making continual experimentations and who thoroughly succeeded in maintaining and improving upon the ancient making of enamels. So the person that he is, teams up with is somebody called, something he's called, he's called Lorenzo, so here he calls him Laurent Ruddy of Murano. And he was an artisan whose beautiful enamels are the results of 40 years of deep study and anxious experience. Uh, in, in 1840, he had received a gold medal at the Imperial Royal Institute of Fine Arts in Venice. And to him, I owe my first impressions of the possibility of restoring the almost forgotten manufacture of enamels from the time of becoming acquainted with him. And, and it is Radi who kind of directs um, Salviati and tells him where to, where to go and look look at the, the great different mosaics that are in the world. And so, 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 so Radi helps educate um, Salviati. And, and then Salviati then goes on to say, my next step was to create a school of mosaic. Selecting the chief artists from the school of painting of the Venetian Imperial Royal Academy. So he goes to the best to get the teachers for these young boys. Um, and while the, art, while the artisans, are, and so he's teaching, he's, they're teaching both fine art, but they're also teaching the, the, the craftsmen, they're teaching them the principles of geometry and drawing. And then, so that's, that's he sets that in motion, like, you know, it's like, that would be enough for me to do, but no, he's doing that. And then he goes, the next, I undertook journeys to distant parts in order to study the best examples that I may be in position to instruct others and assist in their continual improvement. So, you know, that, that, it was really fantastic to find that because you find this, this incredible Renaissance man. And what, what you also find in this talk that he gives that he's also this incredibly savvy businessman. One of the things that he's worried about is, um, will people want the art? He's, he totally gets it as a businessman that, okay, he can make fant fantastic mosaics, right? But if people don't want it, you know, What's the point? So, so he, he's really he's aware of that, and he's aware of the fact that if he starts making mistakes, other people will copy him. Um, he's aware of the fact um, that uh, that you know he he needs to go out and really promote his, his work. So, my first great commission I received from Her Majesty the Queen under the advice of Mr. Gilbert Scott was to cover the ground ceiling of Wolsey Chapel at Windsor Castle with Venetian enamel mosaics. The design comprehended figures besides inscriptions, medallions, coats of arms, crests, mottos, heraldic and sacred emblems, foliage, etc. And then this is kind of an interesting sentence for me. The whole work measured 2,100 square feet. It's huge. And I was able to execute and fix in 10 months. I mean, that is incredible. I mean, so that immediately would have sold him, right? Because here is a man who ca can produce art on these sacred buildings very fast. I mean, that, that is incredible. We couldn't do that now. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, and then not only that, um, including the time of transit from, uh, that included the time of transit from Venice, and then the preparation of the cement, scaffolding, and, and everything, the price was 4,725 pounds, so $10,000 in that time, um, which apparently was kind of the same cost as stained glass at the time, so stained glass windows. So, um, so it, 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 to me, that, that figure is astonishing of how fast he can do it. So that, that's immediately appealing to all the architects, right? That, that he can produce work so fast because the greatest fear to architects is, you know, you, you get these decorators in the final painters and, thing, and they take oodles of time and then they don't get paid by the client. So he was totally aware of that. And he, ju he just can produce. And, and the British just, like, scoop him up. All the British architects. I mean, there is more, pale, and more Salviati mosaics in England than there is anywhere else in the world. Uh, there's a fantastic blog of Salviati mosaic uh, kind of uh, delineating by... 18, so we're talking here 1865, by 1867, I think it is, he's already done 50 
uh, religious buildings in England already. I mean, and he hasn't even entered into a partnership. He then becomes a partner, and he gets some British uh, people to partner in a limited company. But that doesn't happen to seventy-seven. So he's already this hugely success, huge success in London already. Um, but before he even enters into his partnership. So he's a really, really savvy businessman. I mean, he knows, he knows to get the queen as his first client, right? He absolutely, that hit it on the head. And after that, he just, the, the projects just tumble, tumble, tumble out. So, you know, so he enters the field because he's worried about the, 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 the dilapidation of the mosaics in, in St. Mark's. And then here he's kind of selling the mosaic as a technique as far as the enamel itself is concerned, it will be well made. It is absolutely indestructible. What influence can affect it? Not frost or cold or rapid changes in the state of the weather. These could only affect a material if it were extremely dilatable. But the enamel which I use has perhaps less tendency to expand than any other material. The damp cannot injure it because it is less porous than clay, stone or marble. If danger is apprehended from smoke, dust, etc., enamel has a peculiar claim to be preferred to the other methods of obtaining color decoration, for it can be easily washed and cleaned. So you know, here we have the consummate conservator thinking. Um, so, so this, uh, this for me was like a fantastic find, um, and that gives you some insight into the, the beginning of the, the company. Uh, so, and he does have an artist in the company. It's obviously not. Paoletti, but he has an artist, and um, and that's his beginning. And then Lamb Studios, strangely enough, started very at a very similar time. So there was this this, this English family in northern Kent, um, and um, the dad is a I think landscape architect in England, and he has two sons, two little boys, and then his wife dies in childbirth, giving birth to their third child. So he decides to pack it up and go to the United States um, with his two little boys. He finds a job as a landscape architect in some garden um, on the East Coast that I didn't recognize. And they're on, bo on board, and I don't know what happens, but he dies. And these two little boys are on board by themselves. And so a, a family on board adopts them, uh, a Scottish family brings them up. And, and these two little boys are Joseph and Richard Lamb, and they, they grew up really interested in art, they grew up really interested in architecture, um, they, they, they're quite interested in, in sort of restoration too, and they formed the Lamb Studios in Greenwich Village, where they're specifically, and I think it was the first company in the States who specifically were just gonna deal with um, religious buildings. You know, the, the, they did embroideries, they did uh, mural painting. At one point they did a, bit, a little bit of mosaics, I think that maybe was a little later on, um, they did some of the, the metal working for the interior of churches. They didn't at that time do stained glass. They, they did everything else but not stained glass. And so it, it's pretty successful that they, um, they, have, they do work for many uh, churches. And then um, the second generation, which is the generation we're concerned with. So Frederick is the son of Joseph. And Frederick is Joseph's youngest son. And he is the person that... We, we didn't know about in this university, but his brother Charles was actually the person who was running the company. So Charles is the businessman, he's, he's an architect, he's a man about town, he's in, involved in all kinds of committees and, and organizations to do with architecture, and he runs the company, and then uh, his brother is sent off to Paris to be an artist. So Lam has a very um, traditional artistic um, upbringing. He, he goes to Paris, he's, he follows her, and, and he, even more so because one of the courses he takes is in mural painting, and not only is it just mu it's mural painting, it's religious mural painting. And apparently that was considered the hardest art class you could do. So, he, he, so Lamb really learns how to do religious mural painting, which I think really informs his work on the windows here. He comes back, he's a young guy, he's oh, I'm going to be a famous artist, he moves in, to, with three other quite famous American artists. And of course, life is not so wonderful as an artist, right? So he goes and works for the family on the side and he does um, mural paintings because that's what he could do in his sleep because he'd learnt, learnt that in Paris. And while he's doing that, he gets interested in a friend of his dad's 
who happens to be John Lafarge. And John Lafarge is one of the stained glass uh, men in New York who, um, you know, not exactly Tiffany, but pretty close to Tiffany. And also he was, he was very experimental. He, he, he was very interested in different ways of putting glass together. He was a chemist. He knew how to manipulate glass. And, and young uh, Frederick is right there learning, you know, young, he's in his 20s. And he spends, you know, several years kind of looking over his shoulder and learning, learning, learning. So once he has had a sort of a kind of semi-apprenticeship, he then starts producing and running the workshop for Lamb Studios in stained glass. And he's made head of the workshop. Um, Lamb, interestingly enough, you know, had a completely different philosophy to Salviati. Lamb believes that the individual artist should make the artwork from beginning to end. So you, you drew it. You cut the piece, you chose the glass, you cut the glass, you put the lead canes in, and you, know, you put it up on the wall. Um, because you know, he felt that was kind of a, 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 a more joyous thing. The individual was in charge of the whole process where the Europeans had this more, um, I think what he called it, it was factory-like way of, he was referring to stained glass, but you could just as well refer it to Paoletti, uh, the, um, Salviati's way of doing things. So, it's these, so these two men had, kind of different uh, philosophies and how to, to do the, the, the making of art things. So that's a little bit the history of the companies, which is kind of interesting. And then how um, I think this audience all knows how Mrs. Stanford got to, um, to meet them. Uh, she was given a list of stained glass artists in New York. She went to New York. Um, she, I think, was, I planned to visit three studios. Well, I think Tiffany was probably away in Timbuktu, really busy. He was a really busy guy. He had so much going on. Uh, Gorham, I think, um, some employees of Gorham, I mean, answered her questions, but just, just answered her questions, didn't kind of draw her into anything. But when she went to Lamb, Lamb spent a lot of time with her. Um, you know, he had, you know, remember, he had done religious, right? murals. So he knew all the Bible characters. He could, he could converse with Mrs. Stanford. When she started talking about Martha, he knew who Martha was. He knew, you know, he, he had the language that Mrs. Stanford wanted to hear. And, and he probably was thrilled that he, he had a client who really knew what she wanted. And um, had, uh, so they had this great um, meeting. She he has no idea who she is. She comes back to the States and then sends him a letter in, I think, November of 1999 saying, you know, I w we want to employ you to do the windows at Stanford Memorial Church. And he's like, floored. He had no idea who she was. So that's, that's how they got the job. Uh, the, the, uh, how Salviati got uh, the contract. Um, Antonio actually is probably just about alive when Mrs. Stanford goes to visit the workshop with her husband and her son in um, I don't think they went the first time that they were in Europe, but they certainly went the second time in 1873 and then 74. Um, uh, Leon Sanford Jr. You know, dies in Florence. And they had obviously, they had visited Constantinople where we think he caught typhoid. They had seen the Agra Sophia. They were thrilled with that. They went to Venice and looked at St. Marcos. And then they ended up in South Italy Studios because probably Leland, young Leland wanted to learn how are these things made, right? And so they, they go to this workshop and they see and, and Camarino can speak English so, so they can explain everything to them. And so everybody's kind of thrilled and happy because you know, they, they, they're understanding everything. And Leland had a very active mind. He liked to know how everything worked. And so then sadly, you know, he, he, he suddenly gets really sick when they get to Florence and Camarino who speaks perfect English, you know, rushes over and helps Mrs. Stanford. And she remembers that, right? Year, years on, she remembers that. And um, she, con she c comes, I think she get, gives him the contract in 1900, May 1900. She goes to Venice. She spends a couple months there. And she, I think they pretty much work out all the, the program for the, the nave and the, the front uh, maybe not the paintings between the mosaic, the stained glass, but all the rest. Um, so before she leaves, that's all being kind of approved. The facade is a problem, right? Because the first thing is not approved, so they're still kind of working on that. Um, and 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 so they get going. I mean, they're going, and, and their production rate is. I mean, I'm just gobstopped by what they can produce. I mean, they obviously had a lot of men working on 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 the, this at a time. Um, and they just went for it. They knew, 
you know, if one can just understand the complication of these huge pictures, and when you look at them, there's a certain way you need to lay the mosaic in, in a knee. There's a certain way that you have to lay it in an elbow. You can't just go line by line. So the fact that all these young men, now much older, because by the time they get to this position in the company, you look at the pictures, they all look you know, much more elderly men. Um, they knew exactly, you know, they had learned at the school exactly what do you outline, what do you not outline, because Paoletti is not telling them that, right? I mean, he, he's, he's giving them the, the little watercolor and he's doing a big cartoon with the main lines, but really these artisans are the ones that are actually doing the beautiful work of how, you, look, you go and look at the knees of those angels in the church. I mean, it's just incredible that we do that. When I was up there on, those, on the scaffold and I just looked at the cheek of one angel, I counted 37 different shades of pink. I mean, different shades, it's like, whoa. We're going to take a look at some of the artifacts that are stored at the library at Stanford University. Uh, these are original artifacts, um, mostly produced uh, by the, the mosaic studio that the uh, university used, the Salviati workshop in Venice, um, to, to get the approval of Mrs. Stanford for the work that was to be carried out uh, on Stanford Memorial Church in terms of the, the decorative um, facade and inside of all the surfaces. Uh, so first here we have um, a beautiful watercolor representing Moses and the burning bush. All these watercolors were done by Professor Paoletti, who was at that point a fairly elderly man. He lived 10 more years after the Stanford project, but very experienced. His dad was a painter. Uh, he was a painter. He was trained at the Academy in Venice. He was a teacher at the Academy of Venice. And I think he probably also taught uh, the stained glass artist at Salviati. So here we have this uh, beautiful colored watercolor, uh, bright colors. Uh, the artists would have, the, the artists choosing the mosaic glass would have used something like this as their guide for choosing the different tiles. Um, and Mrs. Stanford would have been sent a, 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 this size of painting to approve and um, her approval was a stamp and the date and she sent it back to Venice um, and then the Venetians would then proceed with making a much bigger image and setting the tiles. The second um, painting here is a little gouache. Gouache is a type of watercolor but you're using an opaque white with it so it, it's, it's a more uh, matte kind of finish. There's also gold in the background and this painting you can see the actual mosaic as you face the chancel it's to the left it's between the crucifixion and the nativity, you'll see these three angels holding the cross. The beautiful thing about this little painting is that Professor Paoletti has actually drawn in the mosaic pieces. So it's super detailed and, and, and just a beautiful piece of work. And next on this table here, we have perhaps my favorite artifact that's stored in, uh, in this university uh, for this collection. Um, it's something that usually very rarely survives. It's what every workman in a studio would have, it's called a day book, and they would you know, make notes throughout the day of either what they were doing, or in this case, this belonged to Camerino. And Camerino has uses it not only to paste um, the different mosaics that are being worked on, but next to it, he puts this really detailed pricing schedule. So it's really fascinating to look at this page and see, okay, what, how did they break up the costing of these huge mosaics? What did they itemize separately? And so when you look at this, you see that the labor costs are the first things that is itemized. Then the second thing that's itemized is a smalty, which is the colored, the small colored glass. And that is about a quarter of the cost of the labor costs. Then you get just, they just say gold, and that means the gold mosaics. And that is more expensive than the smalty. It's about one and a half times the cost of the smalty. And then you get something called trichinati, which I am still puzzled exactly what it means, because the word in Italian means cutting. And it would be, seem strange that they would kind of separate the labor of cutting the mosaics as a separate item. 
but, but maybe uh, that still needs to be resolved. And then the last thing is expenses. And the expenses are tiny compared to uh, the cost of the labor. And um, just to, to prove too that all the artists and people that worked at Salviati were trained um, as, as early bo little boys, they were trained in the art of drawing, of painting, and of um, geometry so that they could really understand how to lay out a mosaic. This is one, was one of um, uh, Salviati's uh, sort of important innovations and insistences that when he started his company, that everybody needed to be trained. And not only that, they were taught, everybody had to learn how to read and write. So he created free evening classes for all his staff, and they all learned to read and write. So um, here we have an example of a Camerino who is actually not the main artist. He's not Paoletti. He's the general manager of the company at this point. And yet look at the beautiful drawing that he does of how the layout was going to be in the vestibule of the church. So it just shows that, you know, he had training. He knew exactly how to do drawing. Um, and it, it's kind of really amazing to, to kind of see this testament. Moving along, here we find um, a piece of mosaic. This is probably something that um, was destroyed during the first earthquake in 1906 and was used as rubble in subsequent buildings. Or um, some of the rubble actually was thrown into the stream bed of San Francisquito Creek. And families would go there on Sundays and collect uh, little treasures of these mosaics. So I don't know if those come from here. But the interesting thing for us is that you can see how the mosaics were um, mortared together. So you can see that there's a thick layer, about two inches of a sand and cement and big kind of chunks of red brick in the mixture, which they would have put on the stone wall first. Then they would have had their tiles, the back of the tiles, and they would have smooshed on a very free flowing mix of the same materials, but in this case, the brick would have been like powder, wouldn't have been like chunks. And then they would have grabbed the whole section and they would have slapped it onto the um, main wall of the church. And then they had a special tool to smooth it and tamp it down. And then they'd go on to the next section. So it was an incredibly kind of efficient way of installing these mosaics. I think that this mixture was not something that they brought with them from, from Venice, but they used the concrete mix that was being used on campus at the time for other things. And then lastly on this table, we have a Salviati Company ca catalog of 1920. So this is really after all the, the Stanford project ends. But it, it, it is kind of a, a, a wonderful historical document. It, 1920 is when uh, Camerino takes over the Salviati Company, and he then operates it himself and later with his two sons. And in this book, there's a little bit of history of the company. There's some great photographs of the glass blowing. And then there's this wonderful front frontispiece, which we don't know who drew it. It would be great if it was Antonio Paoletti, but he, he died, I think, about uh, in the mid-teens. But it does speak to a very experienced hand. It's a beautiful gouache again. So that's this table. And here we see the huge mosaic on the facade of Memorial Church. This was enormous. It was like at where the bottom of the steps of Christ is standing to the top of the, the peak of the, the church. It's 30 feet. And then the, the, the longest horizontal measurement is, I think it's 84 feet. So humongous. And first drawing that was done for this uh, space, super important space, because it's right the front of Memorial Church was actually rejected by Mrs. Stanford because it was a little bit too hell and damnation and not very welcoming. It was, you know, Matthews 25, 30, which is, was when, you know, Christ was ascending, but he was also judging the people and he was sort of judging, I think, the sheep from the goats is how the, the actual verse mentions and you get devils and things in these pictures so it, it is actually a little bit scary so what mrs stanford approved was this image where jesus is sort of lifting his hand up and if you look with binoculars you can actually see the marks of the cross on his hands and then all different peoples are coming up women children the roman soldiers everybody is 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 kind of sad but it's a more uplifting scene than than what was drawn initially 
And then let's look over here. And you know, I chose this Adam and Eve again, a fantastic gouache by Paoletti with all this verdant splendor. It's what we see in the photograph that's the main banner for this talk being made in the workshop in Venice. So there's kind of a nice correlation there. Apparently, it's quite amusing. Everything seemed to go on time, but the one thing that I see Camerino kind of complaining about is that Professor Paoletti is taking his time to draw or paint the image for, for, for the Adam and Eva, as he calls it. And in thinking about it, I thought, well, that kind of makes sense because this artist is used to drawing, so his, his, his metier was drawing children in um, sort of scenes of selling flowers or fishing, and, and all these children were in Venice, right? And, and Venice has all these architectural settings. There's no huge parks with all this verdant trees and things. So Paul Pelletti probably hadn't had very much experience, you know, painting trees and, and bushes and, and, and all this exotica. So it, it took him a, a month. This was the, the painting that took him the longest to complete of all the paintings he did. And then finally, we have this very formal portrait, uh, but this is oils, because I wanted to see a different material. That, so they're not only working in watercolors, he's working in oils. Uh, this is a very traditional Renaissance-looking type of painting. Um, you know, Moses looking very solid and grand. When you look at the church and you see Moses, he looks very much like this. And again, this would have been used by the artist as a guide for the colors. There wasn't, when, when these were blown up to full size, they weren't colored. They were just cartoons. They were just black and white. Um, so the artists were working on fairly small drawings to actually choose their colors uh, in the workshop. So here I have some examples of uh, stained glass under tools. Um, the wonderful thing about this period of American stained glass is that they have incredibly creative people like Lafarge and Tiffany who are making their own stained glass. There's many companies at the time. This is the only one that survives to date, Kokomo Glass, which we have used. Um, and this is their catalog. It's kind of fun to look through. And this is a Kokomo piece of plain glass. Kokomo is one of the companies, that, the only company in existence that was in, which, who, who was operating during the time that Lamb made the Stanford Church windows. So we know he used glass from there as well as from other foundries. And this is um, a sheet of glass that's been um, rolled out on a table that had a texture which is known as cat's paw. If you look, if you, I don't know if you can catch that. Can you catch that in the camera? There's sort of like little divots on here, like a little cat has walked over the glass. And a lot of the Stanford church, especially this, the colored glass panes, have this texture um, on the outside. And so that table, that steel table, still exists at Kokomo's. And I've had glass kind of rolled on that table for the university. Um, because it seemed like so amazing that they still had this, this table and they would have had many tables with different, and they're, they're very subtle. It's a very subtle thing that you would have on the out, you would always put on the outside of the glass. You also have things that are not so subtle, which is, would not be in that process, which is like this, where you have the incredible texture in the glass. Glass is folded and sometimes the folds can be three inches folding and you see that in a lot of the angel wings. The Dream of Pilot's Wife has a lot of this glass in it. And then this one here has um, texture on the inside, like, you know, more of like the, this isn't cat's paw, but it's a similar kind of, so, so they created one kind of texture on one side and a completely different. You have this, which is actually an original piece from here, but it's folded. It's not as dramatically folded as some of the pieces you get, but it's the only authentic piece I could find for you. But, you know, sometimes the folds, I think once I measured three inches, the fold went, it was, which is hugely challenging for the putting together of stained glass. I also have a piece of opalescent glass that actually belongs to the church. And for you to see the damage, and we, we do have a, the damage is done when somebody throws a bottle at a piece of glass.
the, so the windows are composed of this sort of amazing glass, some of it handmade. Lamb would have purchased glass from Tiffany. Tiffany did sell his seconds. And then the other part of the glass making of a window is the lead. And the fun thing is here that we have two sections of original leading from the windows in the church. And you can see how lead lines are used by Lamb, and he was really a master at using lead lines as sort of the drawing, and he uses very different leads. And here I have an example of contemporary different leads. The lead face is on this side, and you can have a huge face, which this has to create, you know, very solid. You can see here, this it's this thing here. Or you can use um, a thin lead, and you get a much more subtle. And then he has very complicated leading. This is very, compl very time-consuming, complicating leading. And that's the other thing we noticed in Lamb's, Lamb's windows, is that there's some very, very complicated Letting. He does some very complicated cuts, which um, you know do kind of loopy loops and things, which most people try and avoid because they're, they're, they're most likely going to lead to breakage in the future. But he, poof, he doesn't, he doesn't care. The, the, the doves that he does in the dove cut, it's like, whoa. I mean, I wonder if any of us could do cutting like he did. Really incredible. Um, but when you do that, then you need to really play, play with the leads a lot. And I think that's what he loved, because he used lead as, as a pencil drawing, right? So the lead to him was, was a pencil drawing, and then his colorings. He, the interesting thing I discovered recently was that um, his brother Charles went to um, Salviati before they started designing the windows, because um, both of them were very concerned about you know, like the arts and crafts movement idea of you know, the, the work has to fit the, what it's going to be made for. And so when they heard that there was this whole other scheme of design, they didn't want the stained glass to be fighting that scheme of design. So Charles goes all the way to Venice. He talks to uh, Paoletti, he talks to Salviati, and, and you know, what are you doing? Which, what are you thinking of how it's going? And, um, so, so it's interesting. I would love to have known if that changed the direction of what they thought about the windows, how that kind of affected the decision of how they designed the windows, but we don't know. But in looking at his windows, um, you can see that he, uh, Radjik is using quite dark colors, and I wonder whether that wasn't intentional because he is fighting against all these bright gold surfaces, so it makes sense to then choose darker colored glass so that um, you don't have these kind of total brightness everywhere. And so I went looking at work that he had done at the same time. So it turns out that in 1900, he won a prize for a stained glass called Religion Enthroned. And so, okay, this must be, if Frederick just had to draw, do a design he loved, this is how he would do it. And so when you look at that, it's much lighter and there's lots of teeny pieces involved. And I thought, yeah, that against the church would be completely lost because you're fighting now the gold, glistening gold and things. So I think they did really think about the fact that there were these gold surfaces next to their windows. And they chose deep, rich colors. Uh, they tended to do dark layerings. Um, and then they did a very simple arch in most of those windows above a decorative band, very just, just enough to kind of bracket the window, and there's, there's, there's not much kind of fussiness of design. It's very open. Of course, that really met Mrs. Stanford's expectations because she wanted the, the windows to read like a story, right? So she wanted the story of Christ to kind of flow through the building in a way to have the building was actually like a, a book, like a, like a visual book. Uh, so you just sat there and you could look and, and you could sort of tell the story to yourself. You didn't have to read anything. And, and one of the um, books that Mrs. Stanford and Lamb would have used to choose the different stained glass windows was this one. And when you look at what I marked here, these are all to do with the windows in the church. So we're pretty sure that this is an actual book that Mrs. Stanford looked at to help choose the window choices, which is kind of... We know that the stained glass art at that time, I think in the library in Boston, it's none of the very famous guys, although there is a sales catalog for the Lafarge Library or half of it uh, in existence. But there's a, it was a guy I think called Cormac who they had the list of his whole books. And he has a thousand books of religious paintings, etchings, you know, Dore Bible. Um, this is actually photographs, one of the first books with photographs. So these um, 
stained glass artists had these huge libraries which they then brought out to the client and said, well, what about this? And what I found interesting was, I was just going to look at two, was, um, was one was the Plocker's flight into Egypt. So I thought, well, so did she just see one image and then go for it? But then the interesting thing that even in this book, there's a choice of three flights into Egypt. And so you look at them and you think, well, why would Mrs. Stanford choose this one? And then you realize that this one is much more human. Like Joseph is really looking at Mary like concerned. Mary's looking back at Joseph. The baby's really clinging to little mom. And there's a really family dynamic going on here, which would have really appealed to Mrs. Stanford. Whereas here, it's, you know, Joseph is looking down, you know, the, the babies. There, no, there's no connection between the family. This one is, is, is probably way too formal for Mrs. Stanford. She wanted this idea of, you know, living your daily life by the way that Jesus lived his. And so this, you can, you can totally see when you look at the four others, why Mrs. Stanford would have chosen uh, that image amongst the others. And the other cool thing in here is to just look at briefly is you can see the actual scale of um, the Mary and Joseph in the temple paintings. You can see how horizontal it was. And then, you know, Lamb's incredible skill at making a horizontal painting go vertical. And that takes an enormous amount of skill. And again, it's helped by the fact that he had that Paris training, that very formal Paris training uh, to do that. So let's look a little bit at the, um, the process of making uh, tiles. Um, so the technique for making, so, so the, 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 the difficult thing in the glass making was the glass making. Um, the, the Venetians became really, really good at making these really great pure colors. It's that, I think something this morning was saying, you know, how bright the colors were. And it's because the Venetians really, really excelled in making really bright. They were really strict. They would have what we call a pot to melt the glass in. They would never mix them. They would have like, if this was a turquoise blue pot, that was always a turquoise blue pot. They never, never, never mix them. Um, and they were very careful about contamination. They, um, they, so glass is made of three elements, silica, um, and then something that lowers the melting point and then something that stabilizes the glass. So the, the silica um, is found in sand. And so they imported, I mean, this is the incredible thing that you don't read about. So here we had these islands, you know, called Venice, and none of the materials are local, none. So everything has to be shipped in. I mean, everything has to be shipped in. You think that that would make the cost go up, but you know, so the actually time time is that my labor costs are super low and my cost of materials are super low. So he has to ship in every chunk of wood that he, they use alder and, and willow to keep those furnaces burning. And those furnaces burn 24 hours a day. I mean, so you can imagine the amount of wood that has to be kind of shipped into Venice. And then the sand, the sand isn't from the beach round in Half Moon Bay. No, the sand is like all the way, there's a beach in Crete that had really good sand for making glass that the Venetians liked. And there's a couple of beaches in Sicily. Then there was another thing they liked to use, which were these quartz pebbles that were found in a river up in sort of that came down from the Italian Alps. And so then these pebbles had to be dragged all the way right to Venice. And now we have pebbles, right? So now we have to crush these pebbles so to get this silica sand thing. So it's sort of the, that side of things which you don't read about to me is kind of gobsmacking because it, it's, it's, it's humongous. And then the alkali, so silica has a very high melting point, so you need to lower it. So the alkali they used initially was from plants, plant ash from the Middle Eastern countries, but they soon learned that the coast of France and Spain had similar plants. And you, you burn these plants and then you get soda from these plants um, and it creates a really, really clear glass. And then to that, they add tiny, tiny amounts of metal oxides to create colors. Um, and so here, uh, and, and then what they do is they, they put on their big pipey thing, a blob of glass, and they blob, blob on a table, and then they get like a square plunger and they push it. So they end up what they call making a pizza. So you have this round pizza, and then you just cut it. And, and the, the Venetians had very few tools. They were, 
mostly all their skill was in craftsmanship. And they had this thing, called, there was this hammer, and it had like a, a pointed end. Nowadays, this has a carbide tip, but in those days, they wouldn't have had a carbide tip. They had to keep it sharp all the time. And then they had this anvil that was in a block of wood, and it's called a hardy. They would rest the piece of glass on this edge here, and then they'd bring the hammer down with a sharp, and the hammer weighed about two pounds, between two and five pounds. It's a very heavy. And it's incredible to see a skilled person in like minutes, you see them cut a hundred smalti. I mean, they just ch -ch -ch. And here I have a few examples of smalti from the church. And so they're not using this surface to put for you to see. They're not using this surface. You see, this is the flattest, flattest surface, right? Because we, we laid it here, we squished it, right? They're not using those surfaces. They're using this surface. So they're using the, what we call the riven edge, the cut edge, up or upright. And the reason the Venetians did that was because that was the sh much, because it had recently been cut, right? We cut it on this thing. It was very, very shiny. You can even see it in this photograph. It also cut slightly unevenly. And that's actually what gave the unevenness to the mosaic surfaces was the fact that they're using this riven edge. It's, it's, you, you look at these, it's very, very uneven. Um, and then they glued it, glued it, you know, f face on that because then they, that was what was going to be facing you. The other tiles, the gold tessera tiles, they pour a, a trans again a pizza of transparent kind of. They change the color sometimes. The, the big tiles that I have here are bl a bluey transparent color. The little tiles that we have stamped in stock are like a little light greeny color, and you can see that here. They, it's incredible. A glass blower has to um, blow a huge bubble of glass, very, very thin, and they put it down and they slice it open so that it, it, uh, it, it kind of flattens out on the hot bed. So now they have this really thin, sharp piece of glass and they cut it in a square and they, they put the... There's two ways of doing it, but they, they can put the, the gold leaf on, this, on the blue base and then they bring this thin transparent layer and put it on top and they cook it again. You have to really watch it because you don't want the gold to completely melt and seep out, right? And then they just cut it up and again, they, they, they use this and they just chop, 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 chop. And next to no time they have, you know, hundreds of these little tesserae. Um, I think as Sapna described, those or tiles are all laid onto a sheet of paper and actually the papers were cut not in two by two sections. If you look at this drawing, which I love, if you look carefully, you can see that it's cut actually in all kinds of different shapes. And that's actually following, as I explained to you, when they did it like a, a knee, they followed a certain pattern. They're doing cloud designs with an ear. So, so they're very careful about how they cut out the sections that they're each doing on their tables here. Um, and then those sections are, are packed and shipped. They're not these kind of even, um, even pieces. And then, you know, the Satna had that great photograph of, um, you know, they put in this thick layer of mortar and, and on the Stamford campus they use sand, they use cement, and they use big chunks of brick. I, see, I saw that up in the Angels, we see it over here. I think David will have some more examples. Uh, you see it cons con consistently through the church where they're using mortar and uh, the university. And then as Satna showed, it was kind of interesting for me to see that, was the thin mortar they actually put on the back of the mosaic two-by-two two two section, and then they kind of slap that up onto the, the other one. Um, and they probably can work really fast. I mean, I think they can, I mean, I was calculating. I mean, I think in an hour, I could probably slap four of those up. Um, so four two-by-two-foot sections, uh, and I'm one. And I don't think there was a lot of them. You know, with, I, some of the... Some of the information that we have, I think, is a bit dodgy. I think there was mainly two of them, and they may have roped in some people on Stamford to maybe mix the concrete. But I think the two of them were pretty much doing everything um, because it's very fast. That was the beauty of the technique, right? Like two guys could go up there and just ta 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 ta, and and it just in a day you could do a lot. You could do a lot. So the, the program of restoration uh, or conservation on the church, for the stained glass windows, what we do is that um, every 10 years, we do a very thorough survey of all the windows. And every year, I do an, a more cursory survey. And my cursory survey 
is reported to a group of people, which includes the architect Sapna Marfatia. And, um, but on the 10-year cycle, we bring in an outside uh, stained glass conservator. And actually, one year, we, we used um, David's company. Uh, and they do a much more thorough survey. They, they're actually face to face with the windows, and they, they go over them. Uh, and during that time, we then decide the conservation program for the next 10 years. Does anything need to be done? The, when David last did the survey, we actually found that this window, which is not one of the picture windows, but um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty nice big window above the stairs, needed uh, was actually falling apart, was coming out the lid. So this is why we have this here. So that was um, the most uh, recent window that actually had big, bigger issues than, than the, other, the other windows. Um, other than that, you know, we have damage from vandalism, and that bottles seem to be the main danger to the windows at the church. And I always kind of worry because it was my decision to remove the, the Stanford windows had metal screening on the back of them since the 1960s until the 1990s because they worried that students would um, revolt during the 60s when we were all going wild. And so they wanted to break the windows. So they put this on. They didn't get removed until... Uh, we did the Loma Prieta earthquake. And so every time a bottle hits, when I think, oh, should I have removed the screen? But the, the, the point is that the LAM windows, as being pointed out earlier, are really fantastic in that they read well, both from the inside and the outside. You can actually see faces on the outside, which is really, really rare. And it's something to do with, because uh, he painted on the inside of both the outer panel and the inner panel, and the light seems to go in through the behind of the art panel and then bounces off the drawing of the face that you actually also can see the face on the outside. So that's very unusual um, and so makes them even more special. If the repair is uh, a break where the, uh, it's not huge and um, the glass hasn't come out of alignment, I just get up on a scaffold and I repair it in situ. If um, we recently had the front of the church severely damaged and this is one of the pieces from that and uh, so you can see how severely this is just one of the panel pieces um, you know so that, that we're getting that amount of breakage in one panel uh, so we brought in a, a, a local company who's worked with me before and um, in this case we managed to take out just the panels that were damaged so we could take out um, for instance like a section like that a section like that, and, and leave all this in. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to take them from the top down, um, and we've had to do that here. So then we've had to just fill in the, the hole with um, something meanwhile. Because every, if I, every panel is resting on the one below, you don't want to take the middle one out because then you're gonna get, the lead will start to kind of do weird things. When I do it in situ, um, we have some very good uh, modern adhesives that have the same glass transition temperature as uh, glass, so that the, when, when they're, if they're cleverly filled in along a crack, if I, if I can get the crack to really align and I tape it on both sides, and I, I put this, it's an epoxy, it takes a long time to set, it can take up to a week, but it, it kind of capillarates in, it sits there, and you totally lose the break line if you haven't lost any glass. And it, it's been tested by the Corning Museum. It has a you know, really good reputation and has now been used for about 30 years. So that's like the best outcome. But um, you know, when you have some, that kind of damage, we had to take, so the, the glass is held in place from the face with putty all along the edge. So you have to get a chisel and remove this white putty all along the edge. Then the glass is kind of loosey goosey, but in this, right, in this frame of lead. But there's still these metal copper, so let's look at this one. So let's say in, in this design, like this, this is a horizontal, I would solder to like maybe two points along the horizontal line, um, maybe in, in two, two horizontal lines, these pieces of copper, like just wire. So I, I come to the front of the, of the window, I, 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 I put this against the, the lead, right? And then I tie from, the, from this side, the copper to those, there'll be two bars there. So now it's sort of in place, but it's kind of loosey-goosey, but it's in place right again. So then I fill the edge of this 
rim or from the outside and really butt that glass against it and, 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 and make the lead kind of really tight. Usually it's half an inch, right? So now it's held in that lead channel. And then when that putty gets set, it's really hard. And again, that takes about a month to set because the longer it takes to set, the better seal you get. So that prevents the water from getting in. It holds the panel in place and provides a little bit of a cushion for when the, when the stops it from rattling, right? If you didn't have something like that, then that would rattle. And so that's sort of the basic. Um, now, the lamb windows, of course, are not easy peasy because they're many layered. And I actually have um, rubbings here of sort of one um, section of that, of the, the front window. That, and and that, so this shows like these three layers. And so you're working you know, in the studio with three layers, like Sapna showed two layers um, in her slides. And that becomes really quite complicated because you're having to repair each, each layer separately. But then you have to be looking at the three layers together because if you are putting in replacement glass, it has to read right through the three layers. It couldn't, sometimes you get it, oh, it looks fantastic, you know, really fits in with the, the ski, schema here. And you put the other layer on and it goes red and you think, oh my God, that's terrible, you know. And so you, you really, you're always like, it's like working in 3D, right? Um, and you have it up against the light and you, so it's, um, the lamb windows are a ch challenge because you, know, you, you have to be always thinking, thinking ahead and looking and looking and looking and looking. So when I first started working on campus, I could find some of the replacement glass locally at the local stained glass. There's a place in Mountain View off of San Antonio Road. Um, and there were some places in San Francisco. And you would just go in and ask permission to look through that old stock. And I would find things. But about 20, maybe 20 years ago, it was, became, became very difficult. Um, there's a place in LA that still has so the last breakage we sent the stained glass artist down to LA to have a little bit of a look. Kokomos is still in existence. So I did try something about 20 years ago where there's part of Stanford Church, part of its aesthetic is, is a sort of amber glow that church has. And the amber glow is created both by the stained glass and by the lighting. And I fight for that very hard. Um, so we, we and you can see that in this, that kind of amber look to it. And that is the glass now that is very difficult for me to find. I can find a version of it, but it's too opaque. And the Stanford glass has this kind of light. It, it plays with light, right? And um, we sent somebody, we sent a stained glass restorer, Ariana Marka, who lives in this area, to supervise the glass person. I said, OK, I gave her a piece. I said, you know. I want you to, and you have to make sure that he, he thins out the color here. He, he makes sure that you know, we get this unevenness. But it was kind of impossible. I and mean, we, we have it, and we've, I've used parts of it. But um, it's, it's really hard. Um, you know, during Lamb's time, these guys were in those glass foundries, encouraging, you know, cajoling. You know, and, then, and there were guys prepared. It's, it's very dangerous what you're asking them to do, actually. So they're working with really hot material, and you're asking them to manipulate it in ways. So they want minimum time doing that, and I, I, you're asking for maximum time. So you know, there were a lot of very nasty burns that happened to stained glass makers of stained glass during you know, the period that American Renaissance with Lamb and Tiffany were doing. There was no you know, oversight by any kind of state organization, right? So, so, so it's a problem. It's a problem even, you know, so even when I tried to get something kind of duplicated from a country, company that I know is, was in existence then, right? But obviously the, state, the guy wasn't, right? The company was, but not the person. The other thing that I found when I was dealing with that restoration Stanford Church is that the materials that you use, the minerals that you use, have become much more refined. And that is a problem. That is a huge problem. Um, I was trying to replicate the lenses on the big chandeliers that I love in the middle of Memchu. And the local glass boilers, I kind of knew the, all the guys in Oakland. I said, Leslie, it's, it's, they're just coming out too white. And, and, and we're, we've seen the cross section. We're kind of imitating it. And in the end, I imported some minerals from I think it was New Zealand. 
And that was the only way I got close to, because um, in New Zealand was obviously not refining it so much. And um, it, they were less pure, because it's sometimes kind of the impurities in those raw materials that are giving you the effect you eat, which is sort of, I think, well, the Venetians knew, right, that that sand coming from Crete had a stability. Now, they knew, didn't know what that was, but it's, it's, we know, right, it was some, somehow there was some calcium in there, right? So um, all these materials had bits and pieces in them, right? They weren't refined very well, and it's those bits and pieces that created some of the qualities that we love in, this, in these materials. That is Mrs. Stanford. I mean, that church is Mrs. Stanford, and so that's what everybody has to understand, that, that she's the Grand Duchess. That building is the Grand Duchess of the campus, and you have to treat that building as the Grand Duchess of the campus, you know, respect it, revere it, and understand and for all its idiosyncrasies, understand it. I mean, it's, I mean, I thought she was quite forward-looking in that she wasn't actually a very religious person in, in that the kind of way that a lot of Victorians were. And I mean, yes, she, she believed in faith, but it was more of, I have to leave you know, a, a very upright life. I have a civic responsibility to be a good citizen. I have a civic responsibility to you know, the children of California. Um, that you know that, that that sort of scheme of the life of Christ is it, in a way it could be any man. It's it's like could be you. She wants you to believe that's you. It, lead this upright type of life. Be good. Be kind. You know Martha. Look Martha cleaning his feet. Be you know be generous. You know listen to people. You know you you, you kind of look at it all in, from that kind of point of view, and it, it's like very special. And then you end up. The last stained glass, so you had Jesus, but the last stained glass, guess what? That's her family. That's her son, that's her husband, that's her. So she's trying to say, we try to lead our lives like, like this, you know, like, like Jesus. Uh, and we want you to do the same. We want you to be upright citizens, that, you know, when you become famous Silicon Valley executives, we, you know, you want, want you to remember, you know, the poor people. We want you to remember that you were lucky in what you were given, and other people are not so lucky. Uh, she was, you know, she was very, um, very conscious of that. You know, she goes to Brighton when she's in England, and she watches this crocodile and, of orphans and, uh, for several days as she goes and wanders about the front. And one day she says to, to Bertha, oh, let's order some fabric. And so they order boats, bolts and boats of fabric. And one of it is sort of children's fabric, and the other is kind of black gabardine, and they send it to the orphanage because Mrs. Stanford had noticed that the nun's habits and the children's habits were all fraying and falling apart, and she wanted them to make themselves new clothes, you know. So she's like always paying attention of how she can help, you know, those that are less fortunate than herself. And I think that's what she felt was so important, that you can't be, you know, the head of Google and just do what on earth you, you want to do, that you, you do have to care for your society. You do have to care for, you know, what the, the, the other people that are, the, you know, the, the poor people that we see on the streets that are living in tents and uh, that, that, that haven't been lucky enough to, to kind of lead the lives we have. And, and that was super important to her, much more so than really religiosity, right? Like, like quoting things from the Bible. She was, she was not into dogma. Uh, which is unusual because actually a lot of Victorians were into dogma. So, uh, so she was in a way kind of different. It's become this unique building that we've preserved as near to after the, the 1906 earthquake as, as it can be. Uh, and we made that decision uh, in, in 1990 because there was going to be, when the specs were written for that restoration, it was going to be a very different restoration. They were going to use... Um, precast, they were going to use uh, fiberglass, there was going to be paintings instead of mosaics, so there was going to be a really a, a deviance from what's there. And um, me and Terry Barnum changed that direction. And, with, and, and I'm hoping that you know, the fact that we made that decision then will, will continue forward, that, that that's the one building on campus that we try and keep as near to um, to its original kind of intent, um, because it, it, it has so, so many layers of meaning. There's, you know, there's, there's the whole connection with Mrs. Stanford and her, her family and her 
you know, the reason why she built the, the church and the university, and that's really embedded in all that work. Um, there's the fact that now that has become, that building has become kind of a document to art history of that time because we haven't changed anything. Um, it's also a document to church kind of history because it is like a book. You know, when you sit there, the other thing, it is like a book. You know, it is like one of these books, these illustrated church books of that time. It's very much of that era. Um, so it has these many layers that, that you can still read very readily, you know, quite apart from, you know, the fact that it's, you know, the center of the church, the center of the university and all the other connotations that it has with the university. Um, I hope that they'll kind of go the extra mile to kind of keep the, um, the original intent of the, the artisans and Mrs. Stanford to a certain extent uh, intact.